Good evening. My name is Keith Brandt, and I'm the pastor of the Monroe Street Christian Church in Hollywood, California. It's good to be with you again. We're going to continue our Bible study here in the Gospel of John. <clears throat> Since last week, we celebrated the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It suits us to mention that tonight because Jesus' resurrection gives credibility to everything and to every other truth taught in the Bible. It's the chief cornerstone of our faith, our hope, and our love. And what he brings to us is the way and means to really know him personally and to be changed that we might someday be compatible with God. Just before the third chapter begins, in 23 of chapter 2, the scripture says, Now when he, and that's Jesus, was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Jesus knew that people would be fascinated, certainly if nothing, if nothing more than that, by the miracles. Of course, the miracles were very important. They testified to who he was. They testified that he had authority to give them, to do them. But because of that, uh, there would be that element that really weren't following him. They were following the thrill of the miracle. So he wasn't depending upon what man thought certainly hoping for people who desired to really know about him to find out who he was really because Jesus is really the son of the living God. Tonight we're going to begin in chapter 3. It says, And there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night, and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now, being a Pharisee, <clears throat> this man Nicodemus was already disposed to believe in miracles, in the possibility of miracles. The Pharisees taught that there were angels, that God personally intervened in the affairs of men, that miracles were possible, that all the miracles that were spoken of in the scripture actually happened. That's what the Pharisees taught. The Sadducees did not. The Sadducees, you might say, were more of the liberals of their day. They did not believe in that kind of intervention. And that may explain why uh, the high priest himself was so much uh, disenchanted with Jesus or, or, shall we say, envious of Jesus because he didn't come from a background of believing in real supernatural intervention because he himself was a Sadducee even though he rose to the position of a high priest. But these Pharisees came and they would be touched by the miracles that they saw and believing that the Bible was true they could make a greater connection with what Jesus taught to the Old Testament scriptures that he represented. In another place he said, these are they concerning the scriptures that testify of me. So he's, he's bringing that message about himself and about God the Father from the outset of his ministry. And so this man named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, came to Jesus by night. Uh, why did he come by night? Well, maybe he really didn't want to come by day. Don't you imagine there's some kind of chit-chat going on among all the religious leaders about this Jesus of Nazareth? The crowds are gathering, they're gaining momentum. This is toward the first of his ministry, but it's gaining momentum. And the people are, are very much invested in what Jesus is showing of himself. Also, many of them must have known the teachings in Daniel that seem to pinpoint that portion of time in the scripture when the Messiah was going to appear. So these Pharisees are very interested in uh, possibly finding the Messiah if he is coming or if he's there. And so there is a curiosity that is perhaps supernaturally induced. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know 
<clears throat> now think of that. He says, we know. We know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. He, he probably looked in his history. They thought about it. Moses did this. Elijah did that. Elisha did this. One prophet did this. One. He's got all the earmarks of the prophets, of the prophets and, and the things that God does through men that are sold out to him. So at the very least, they see him possibly as a prophet for their day. As to whether he's really the Messiah, there's a lot of conversation going on with them, you can be sure. And isn't that kind of the way it is sometimes now when you find someone that doesn't really believe and yet you have a conversation with them and you begin to talk about certain things and you know what the scripture says and you begin to identify certain areas of scripture and saying, but Jesus said this and, and uh, Jeremiah says this and, and you know, and, and these people are listening because deep down, people are very hungry to fill that void that is left in their hearts by the fall of man. God has sent his son to fill that void. So he says, you, we believe you do that you have to come from God because no one can do this unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. <clears throat> now, when I think of that, when I, when I say that right off the bat, I'm thinking about seeing the kingdom of God. Is that a visual concept? Yes, in some ways it is. If someone is not born again, they'll never see the reality of the kingdom of God. It takes a new birth experience. It takes a spiritual rebirth because God has to reconstruct us from how fallen man is. And the only way we can be reconstructed is to come and put ourselves in the hand of the Creator Himself, who is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Because the Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, we've already read it a couple of weeks ago, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And it also says in the beginning of that passage, and without him was not anything made that was made. So Jesus was operating in the creative act of the earth and mankind from the very beginning. And so when he says you need to be born again, you, you need to be changed. You need to have an experience that is just like if you were just born again without all of the taint of sin. Most assuredly, I say to you, he's speaking to a Pharisee, unless, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I think that also means he cannot recognize the kingdom of God, you see. Cannot recognize the kingdom of God. Corinthians tells us, Paul tells us by the Holy Spirit, the natural man or the unaided man, the man that doesn't have the scripture in his backdrop here, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, neither can he know them. They are foolishness to him because they are spiritually discerned. So how do we have spiritual discernment? We have to be born again. We accept Christ as our Savior. Now let's just talk about that a minute because when you and I hear the word, the scripture says in another place, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Some manuscripts say the word of Christ. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. All right. So the natural man, say the unaided man, begins to hear the word of God. Well, the, the word of God is the word of the Son of God, who is the living word, and the word of the Holy Spirit, and the word of the Father. Remember, Jesus says, I don't say anything except I hear the Father say it. So when Jesus is teaching, he's teaching as the Father teaches. And so he tells him, you must be born again. You, ha you have to be changed to be right with God. And he says, uh, if one is not born again, he cannot see the kingdom of, God, kingdom of God. He can't understand it. And he can't appreciate it. Nicodemus said to him, uh, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? So, I mean, he really understood the concept of being born. He understood that. He might have had children of his own, you know. But I'm sure he must be thinking, There's God, he's got to mean something different than that. And then um, 
Jesus answered and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So when we go back where it says, if you're not born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He's probably talking about enter into the kingdom of God. Really, it just means can't have any part of the kingdom of God unless a person is born again. Is God so exclusive that he doesn't want anybody to, that he wants to make it hard on us? No. What he's telling us is that there's only one way to have sin removed out of my life. I needed to have sin removed from my life. And when that happened, uh, I, I started to become, well, I really did become in the spirit, thank you, became um, spiritually born again. <clears throat> when that happened, I became a new creature in Christ Jesus. Now, we're still wearing sinful flesh. So for any of you out there who've not had the new birth experience yet, by the way, the Lord is waiting for you. He's calling you. If you haven't had the new birth experience, you might not understand some of what I'm talking about, but it is a supernatural action that is provided by our literal taking hold of Christ voluntarily. No one's beating us on the head to do it. It's a voluntary act, just the way it was a voluntary act when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. They voluntarily disobeyed God. They voluntarily chose to follow what Satan had them do or requested that they might do, and they did do that. Eve was deceived, but she did do it. Adam watched the process, and he did it. All right? It was a deliberate act. It takes a deliberate act on part of fallen man to come back to God. It just doesn't automatically happen. Someone thinks about Aunt Sally or something who was such a good person. Oh, she didn't go to church, but she was so kind. She did everything for us. She, she did this, she did that. And it isn't that God doesn't appreciate the good things that people do, but it can't save anybody. You see, it, it can't provide salvation. The only way we can be saved to, is to accept the Lord Jesus Christ because in doing so, we put him on as a supernatural spiritual garment. We wear his righteousness. So then when we go into the presence of the living God uh, in prayer, we come holy and perfectly in tune with his righteousness. We're compatible with his righteousness because we've put on Christ. The Apostle Paul tells us, put on Christ. It's a deliberate act, okay? It's a deliberate act. When I, was, when I accepted Christ, the pastor said to me, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? I said, yes, I do. And he said, do you accept him as your Lord and Savior? I said, yes, yes, I do. Well, it was a deliberate act. Certainly, I'd thought about it. I, I'd been taught about it. I, I was a child, but I was a child that understood some spiritual things because children understand much more than we fully give them credit for, especially when we're giving them the Word of God. Now, this is a religious leader. This is a Pharisee speaking to Jesus. This Pharisee, even if he's a humble man, must have had some pride attached, which is not always bad, but some pride attached to the fact that he was a Pharisee, that he was regarded in high esteem by the people because he was a person who is supposed to understand spiritual truth. So when Jesus speaks to him and he says, I, I, I don't understand what you're saying. Do I have to enter again into, into my mother's womb? See? So Jesus says, Most assuredly I say to you, verse 5, Unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. There are two understandings of this passage, and it may be that it refers to both things. One of them is that unless one is born of the water, remember when a child is born, the water breaks in the mother's womb, and the child comes out. All right? So that's the first birth. We've all had that or we wouldn't be here. The second birth is of the Spirit. See, the natural birth did not give us the, the, holy, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit because we were tainted even at birth in some measure. And so anyway, he says, unless one is born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, let's also talk about the other concept of the water and the Spirit. 
Some believe water refers to baptism, the act of baptism. You have to be born of the water and of the Spirit. And it isn't that you're saved by being baptized, but wanting to be saved, yielding to the calling of God, brings you to the water of baptism. And because Jesus has commanded baptism, he must really believe that there's something that we need to be involved in, in baptism. So baptism is really not an option. But I can't tell you today that the act of baptism saves us. But it is the faith that brings us to the water. It's a faith that brings us out of our new beginning relationship with Jesus Christ. The faith that makes me want to be obedient. And the symbolism. Peter said it's not the washing away of the sins of the flesh, but an answer of a good conscience toward God. So we believe God when he says, I'm going to forgive you if you accept my son. So I know, and you've seen me when I baptize some, and have I not baptized uh, somebody in this room? Yes. So when I baptized you, I said, buried with Christ, rise to walk in newness of life. Because old things are passed away, behold, all things have become new. That means we have a clean slate. Doesn't mean we never sin again. But there will be the Holy Spirit in us now, working with us in a mighty way, who will convict us when we mess up. And we say, we, we sort of feel like we have what we might call the guilties. Because the Lord does not want us to get off track. So he has to remind us that when we fail, we've got to get back in the center lane with him. Anyway, he, Jesus go on, goes on to say, because that which is born of the flesh is flesh. Now see, I see that as cooperating with the water picture here. That's the first entrance into life, all right? That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So he's saying, you've already got the fleshly thing going on. Now you need the supernatural thing. Now you need to be the super, have the nat supernatural thing because if we don't have the Holy Spirit in us, we can't be compatible with God. And if, we can't, if we're not compatible with God, we cannot enter into his presence. We can't go to heaven because we, will be, we won't be compatible with him. And I just have an idea. I, I, can't, I can't necessarily uh, find a place in Scripture to support it entirely, but I rather feel that there is such an opposition to unholiness in the presence of God's holiness, that unholiness cannot stand in the presence of his righteousness. It isn't that God doesn't want us to come, it's that we cannot come. The essence of who he is is incompatible with sin. So we have to be born again so that we may become compatible with God and know that we have, a, and then we have a relationship with him. And the amazing thing is, in many ways, we begin to be somewhat like him. He begins to manifest his character in us. There'll be things that we used to do that now we'd say, whoa, man, how could I have done that? Well, that was, that was three years ago. <laughs> you don't know what you know now, and you, you, you didn't have the relationship with the Lord you have now. Praise God, we're all growing, I hope. Aren't we all growing? Hallelujah. In our relationship with God. Now in verse 7 he says, Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. All right, you won't see the Spirit, but you'll see what it does, what he does rather, not it, the Holy Spirit, what he does in your life. It, it will be something you begin to recognize in your life when the Spirit's at work. We don't see wind, but we see what it does. We see the trees going and the leaves. We see that, but we don't see wind. And so he's saying that's the work of the Spirit. We can't really see the Holy Spirit, but the effects of who he is and what he does in us can become visible. And they're supernatural. Nicodemus answered and said to him, well, how can these things be? Now Jesus answered and said to him, are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Now when Jesus says no there, it could be that he is saying, do you not recognize these things? Because Nicodemus may never have had the kind of teaching that Jesus is giving him. 
And so when he, has, he isn't grasping it yet as Jesus is talking to him, and J Jesus may be saying, as a teacher of Israel, do you, not, do you not recognize these things? Do you not begin to understand these things? You see, Jesus is speaking the living word of God to Nicodemus. And faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So faith is being built in Nicodemus. And also, I think, a sense of humility. When he says, I just don't, how can these things be? So I think Nicodemus is a very fine man who has just encountered God in the flesh. Jesus says, most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. Now the apostles <clears throat> are traveling with Jesus. Is he talking about them when he says we? Personally, I think he's talking about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I think he's saying we speak what we know. He's the one who's just said these things to the man. The apostles haven't been joining in. We don't even know if Jesus has anybody else around him. If it is a private interview with Nicodemus, you know, we just, we don't know. Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. Now, when he says you do not receive, I think he's touching back on him saying, how can these things be? I don't think Nicodemus is deliberately refusing to receive it. He hasn't caught into it yet. And so Jesus says, we, ha we testify what we've seen and you do not receive our witness. You, you haven't figured it out yet or you haven't caught hold of it yet. Because I don't think Nicodemus in any way is trying to resist what Jesus is saying to him. Now there were those among the Pharisees who didn't believe and were angry that Jesus was out there. Same with the Sadducees. But Nicodemus isn't one of those. Jesus continues, if I've told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Wow. No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man, who is in heaven. Now Jesus is standing right there. And the word Son of Man is a title out of the book of Daniel that is used to delineate the Messiah, which we learn after we accept Christ and as we're accepting Christ and understanding his identity, it refers to the Son of the living God. Peter later on, well, Peter says just that, you know, when Jesus says, Who, whom do men say that I am? And Peter says, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, flesh and blood has not told you this, Simon, son of Jonah, but my Father who is in heaven. Because it's a supernatural knowledge that Jesus is imparting. And Jesus says in verse 14, <clears throat> And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now when... The Israelites were in the wilderness. They committed some terrible sins. You know, they traveled with Moses for 40 years. And they really messed up sometimes. Gave him a hard time. And God had to discipline them. And he sent a plague among them because they'd been so unruly and so disobedient. And then, of course, they prayed and cried out to God and so forth. And Moses was told to place a serpent on the rod and it may have been his own rod and hold it up and anyone would that would look upon that serpent would be healed why look upon the serpent because it represented the sins that they'd committed people had to own up to what they'd done in order to get repentance you know it's not enough to be sorry that you're caught we have to be sorry for what we've done we have to recognize that what we've done is out of line with what god wants for us because all he wants for you and me is the things that will help us to build us up. He loves us with such an enormous love that he moves in our lives to keep us from making absolutely awful mistakes. And then he says, For God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So it is an act of faith, but what does it bring? Everlasting life. And then verse 17 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God, nets, God gets no pleasure out of condemnation, out of condemning people. He brings information so that we might see where we've, I'll use an old time word, erred. Some people say where I erred, but it's really erred, where I made a mistake, where I messed up, where I sinned, okay? That through him, Jesus, we might be saved. Then verse 18, he who believes in him is not condemned, hallelujah, but he who does not believe is condemned already. You see, the position of the unbeliever, first of all, is that they're already in unbelief. That's no new thing for them. They're already condemned. That is the condemnation of those that do not know the Lord. They're already condemned. Not because God hates them or doesn't want them to go to heaven. It's because they haven't found him. They haven't hooked into what he has for them. And unless they're born again, unless they are a new creature in Christ, they cannot go to heaven. Because, and it says here, but he who does not believe is condemned already. Why? Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. The word name there is associated with different things in a person's reputation. Uh, those that believe in the name of the only begotten Son of God, it's, it's, a, it's an identifying mark, a person's name. But more than that, it is the embodiment of who they are reflected in their name. And Jesus' name means Savior. Joshua is his name in the Hebrew, or Yeshua. And in the English, it's, it's uh, Jesus. And so uh, it's the one who saves. And he's true to his name. Now in verse 19, he goes on to talk about the plight of the world at large. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. They didn't want the exposure of the knowledge of Christ coming in upon them, because it's going to show the things in their life, in their life that they like to do most are things that are in opposition to what God wants them to do. And it affects who they are. Because their deeds were evil, he says. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. I want to tell you, I want to tell you that the Word of God is God's light book. When we open it up and start to read it, the light comes on. It exposes a lot of things that are bad, but more than that, it reveals so much that is good. And we need to know what that is. The more we hook into what God shows us of himself and, and the good things that he provides, the more we will experience the joy of living and the knowledge of Christ in us as the hope of glory. He says, and this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world, that men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light. That they have been, oh, excuse me, that, that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. So we, we don't have any shame when we come before the Lord, when we're striving to do what he wants us to do. Even when we make mistakes, if you and I know that we've made an error, uh, but not with the integrity of our daily walk impugned, you know, it's uh, we, because we just didn't know something was wrong or we shouldn't have done such and such. 
But even when we know we shouldn't do something and we have done it, we still have a way back because what doing that is certainly sin. And uh, John tells us, my little children, if you sin, you have an advocate with the Father who is Jesus Christ. And an advocate is a lawyer. He's the one that speaks up on our behalf, and why shouldn't he? He's made it possible for us to come to him because he's our mediator. He's our go-between, between between man and God. That's, that's, That's where Jesus sits, at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us. Speak to the Father on our behalf. Praise God. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, And there he remained with them and baptized. Now John was also baptizing in Anaim near Salim because there was much water there and they came and were baptized. We'll come back to this place next week. Praise God. God bless you. Monroe Street Christian Church here in Hollywood signing off 4160 Monroe Street Los Angeles 90029, California. God bless you. This is Keith Brandt. Take care.